and voices alarm over Palestinians' death toll in Israeli rescue operation. Singapore Airlines to compensate passengers injured in turbulence flight last month. Thanks for choosing World Today on Brita RTM. Salam Malaysia Madani, I'm Renee Fong. The United Nations has voiced alarm at the civilian toll of Israel's rescue of four hostages in Gaza. The UN Rights Office said acts committed by the Israelis may amount to war crimes. Israeli forces stormed Nusrat refugee camp last Saturday to rescue four Israeli hostages, resulting in at least 274 Palestinians killed and 698 wounded during the operation. We are profoundly shocked at the impact on civilians of the Israeli forces operation in Al Nusrat at the weekend to secure the release of four hostages. Hundreds of Palestinians, many of them civilians, were reportedly killed and injured. The manner in which the raid was conducted in such a densely populated area seriously calls into question whether the principles of distinction, proportionality and precaution as set out under the laws of war were respected by the Israeli forces. Commenting on the figures provided by the Gaza Health Ministry, Lawrence said that prior to 7th October, when there was greater possibility to check, the UN had consistently found the numbers provided by the ministry were very close to being 100% accurate. The UN Rights Office has had limited access to verify numbers since the war started, but Lawrence said it still has contacts on the ground who are reliable. Then on a related note, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for all parties to the Israel-Hamas conflict to reach an agreement on the ceasefire plan outlined by U.S. President Joe Biden. During an emergency humanitarian conference for Gaza in Jordan, Guterres described the conditions in Gaza as deplorable, saying the speed and scale of the carnage and killing there were the worst he had seen since his tenure as U.N chief began in 2017. Excellencies, the order must stop. It's high time for a ceasefire along with the unconditional release of hostages. I welcome the peace initiative recently outlined by President Biden and urge all parties to seize this opportunity and come to an agreement. Meanwhile, Jordan's King Abdullah said that humanitarian access to the Gaza Strip cannot wait for a ceasefire and cannot be subject to a political agenda. He also stressed the importance of containing tensions in the West Bank to avoid an escalation of the conflict. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi also called on nations to force Israel to stop using hunger as a weapon and remove obstacles to the distribution of aid in the Gaza Gaza Strip. Hamas has given its official response to the latest truce proposal for Gaza on Tuesday, calling for a complete halt to Israeli aggression as fighting raged in the Palestinian territory. According to a source, Hamas proposed amendments to the plan, including a ceasefire timeline and the complete withdrawal of Israeli troops from Gaza. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had reaffirmed his commitment to the proposed six-week ceasefire, which was also backed by a U.N. Security Council vote. Blinken then attended a summit in Jordan alongside leaders from the Arab world and beyond, addressing Gaza's humanitarian crisis. The Israeli siege has left Gaza's 2.4 million people without adequate food, clean water, medicines and fuel, pushing many to the brink of starvation, with only occasional aid shipments provide temporary relief. Talks were expected to continue via Qatari and Egyptian mediators coordinated with the United States. 
UK leader Rishi Sunak on Tuesday sought to get his lackluster general election campaign back on track by promising voters tax cuts and lower immigration as he launched his Conservative Party's manifesto. The Prime Minister also pledged greater home ownership to, to a largely disaffected electorate away from poll front-runners Labour before the vote on 4th July. With surveys showing the Conservatives consistently about 20 points behind Keir Starmer's Labour Party, Sunak has stepped up his argument that the opposition would derail the economic recovery and cannot be trusted in government. Launching the party's manifesto, the Formula One racetrack Silverstone in central England, Sunak said he would lower payroll taxes and abolish the main rate for self-employed people by the end of the next parliament. Sunak also promised to halve migration numbers, build more houses and provide financial support for first-time home buyers. Centre-left Labour are in poll position, however, and Tuesday's launch marked one of Sunak's last chances to close the gap in his bid to overtake the main opposition. But I'm not blind to the fact that people are frustrated with our party and frustrated with me. Things have not always been easy, and we have not got everything right. But we are the only party in this election with the big ideas to make our country a better place to live. The Democratic Republic of Congo swore in Judith Suminwa Toluca as Prime Minister on Tuesday, along with her downsized 54-member cabinet ending over six months of delays following President Felix Tshisekedi's re-election and his allies' parliamentary dominance. She said Kedi won a second term in late 2023 after elections that handed his sacred union coalition around 95% of National Assembly seats. However, internal wrangling over ministerial posts delayed the government's formation. The president eventually named Suminwa as Congo's first female prime minister in 1st April and his ex-chief of staff Vital Kamuhe as parliament speaker on 22nd May, paving the way for the new cabinet's appointment. The new government comprises 54 ministers, a smaller than expected downsizing from 57 previously despite pressure to reduce costs. She Sekedi's communications director, Eric Nyindu, said the delays allowed time to find compromise between coalition parties. Then in Singapore, Singapore Airlines SIA said Tuesday it had offered U.S. $10,000 in compensation to passengers who suffered minor injuries on a flight hit by extreme turbulence last month and will discuss higher payouts with those who were more seriously hurt. In a statement, SIA said those who sustained more serious injuries have been invited to discuss a compensation offer to meet each of their specific circumstances. While passengers medically assessed as having sustained serious injuries, requiring long-term medical care and requesting financial assistance are offered an advance payment of 25 thousand US dollars to address their immediate needs. In addition, the carrier said it would re refund the airfares of all passengers on the flight, including those who were not injured. The compensation amounts are determined by the severity of each passenger's injuries based on the information provided by the medical institutions. Earlier, SIA gave 740 US dollars to each passenger departing Bangkok for their final destination to cover their immediate expenses. Coming up, Malawi VP and nine others killed in plane crash. Stay for more. Malawi's Vice President Salus Chilima was killed in a plane crash after searches located the wreckage of the aircraft in a mist-shrouded forest. The remains of Chilima and others killed in the crash were flown back to the capital, Lelongwe.
The military plane carrying Chilima and nine others disappeared on Monday after it failed to land in the northern city of Mzuzu due to bad weather and was told to return to the capital, Lulongwe. Rescuers had been combing a fog-cloaked forest south of Mzuzu yesterday after authorities located the last tower it transmitted to before the plane disappeared. The search and rescue team has found the aircraft near a hill in the Chikangawa forest, and they have found it completely destroyed with no survivors, as all passengers on board were killed on impact. Words cannot describe how heartbreaking this is, and I can only imagine how much pain and anguish you all must be feeling at this time. President Lazarus Chakwera said he had previously flown on the same aircraft for similar trips, adding that the crew had successfully operated it just hours before the accident. First elected vice president in 2014, the charismatic yet stern talking Shalima was a widely loved figure in Malawi, particularly among young people. Such tragic news and not so great in Denmark either, where its Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen said she is still recovering both physically and mentally from an assault in central Copenhagen last week and warned about more aggression in the public. A 39-year-old Polish man was remanded in custody over the assault, which caused her to suffer a minor neck injury. Authorities said the attacker was under the influence of alcohol and drugs at the time, and nothing indicated a political motive. Frederiksen said she was not quite herself yet after the incident. Jamen, jeg har det ikke helt øh, godt endnu. Jeg er ikke, øh, jeg er ikke mig selv øh, endnu, og, og det har også været en lidt svær weekend, skal jeg være ærlig at sige, hvor jeg har haft øh, brug for noget ro øh, og tid sammen med min familie. Og det, det er meget sjældent, at jeg har brug for ro. Jeg har ikke prøvet det i mange år. Øh, så øh, jeg, har, jeg, jeg, jeg er ikke helt mig selv endnu. The assault happened just three weeks after Slovakia's Prime Minister Robert Fico was seriously injured in an assassination attempt. The small bicycle-friendly country ranks in surveys as one of the happiest in the world, and Danes pride themselves on their inclusiveness, equality and generous welfare model. However, Frederiksen said she has witnessed a shift in the public domain in recent years, adding that her personal security detail would be boosted going forward. Now here's an inside scoop of Joe Biden's son where a jury found Hunter Biden guilty of federal gun charges in a historic first criminal prosecution of the child of a sitting U.S. president. The 54-year-old son of President Joe Biden was convicted on all three of the felony counts stemming from his 2018 purchase of a handgun while addicted to crack cocaine. The verdict comes as his father is seeking re-election and the Democratic president expressed his love and support for his son in a statement released immediately after the conviction. Biden said he will accept the outcome of the case and will continue to respect the judicial process as Hunter considers an appeal. The 12-member jury deliberated for about three hours over two days before reaching a verdict. Hunter Biden did not take the stand during the one-week trial and he could face up to 25 years in prison, although as a first-time offender jail term is unlikely. A date was not set for sentencing, but it is expected to take place in the next few months. The trial outcome comes less than two weeks after the conviction on business fraud charges of Donald Trump, Joe Biden's likely Republican opponent in the November presidential election. The proceedings have complicated Democrats' efforts to keep the election focused on Trump, the first former president convicted of a crime. 
The World Health Organization blamed four major industries, tobacco, ultra-processed foods, fossil fuel and alcohol, for 2.7 million deaths a year in Europe, accusing them of extracting public policies that could hurt their profits. The WHO said the four industries kill at least 7,000 people in the region every day. The consolidation of the industry sectors into a small number of multinationals has enabled them to wield significant power over the political and legal contexts in which they operate and to obstruct public interest regulations which could impact their profit margins. Industry tactics included exploiting vulnerable people through targeted marketing strategies, misleading consumers consumers and making false claims about the benefits of their products or their environmental credentials. The UN Health Agency said these tactics threaten public health gains of the past century and prevent countries from reaching their health targets. It added industry lobbying was hampering efforts to tackle non-communicable illnesses such as cardiovascular disease, cancer and diabetes. The WHO urged countries to fight back by enforcing stronger regulations on the marketing of unhealthy products, monopolistic practices and lobbying. Mother Nature taking charge again as planes were grounded on flooded runways at the airport in Palma, the capital of the Spanish island of Mallorca, as heavy rains swept over the popular tourist destination. The storm brought all activity to a halt at Sant Sant Joan Airport, Spain's third biggest, due to the impossibility of operating safely. Transport Minister Oscar Puente said the airport activated its emergency plan and flights to Mallorca were temporarily rerouted to alternative airports. However, Puente later said on social media platform X that the airport was resuming operations as the rain subsided. The National Weather Agency said its station at the airport recorded rainfall of nearly 5 centimetres per hour, with peaks of up to 9 centimetres in less than an hour. Cars also struggled to traverse the airport's flooded parking lot. Passenger traffic at the airport last year reached 31.1 million, an all-time record. The Mediterranean island, known for its picturesque beaches and sunny weather, is one of Europe's most visited destinations, especially popular with German and British tourists. Then in France, panic broke a fire, as fire broke out at France's Palace of Versailles, prompting a brief evacuation but causing no casualties or damage to its collections. Firefighters said a fire broke out at a construction site near the roof of the main building, which was quickly extinguished with a bucket of water. Nearly 100 firefighters were mobilised and teams remained on site to prevent any new fires. The palace's spokespeople said the chateau was evacuated as a security measure, but the castle and gardens reopened yesterday afternoon as the incident was quickly brought under control. The Palace of Arcelles, the third most visited site in France, behind Disneyland Paris and the Louvre Museum, welcomed 8.1 million visitors last year, most of them foreigners. The historic monument is due to host the equestrian events at the Paris Olympic and Paralympic Games this summer. Early exit for Malaysia despite a win against Taiwan. That's coming up in the sports segment. Tidak 
kicking off our sports segment this afternoon, Malaysia suffered early exit in their World Cup qualifying campaign despite a 3-1 win over lower-ranked Taiwan at the National Stadium in Bukit Jalil last night. The win was not enough as Malaysia needed to beat Taiwan by at least eight goals with the hope that Oman will beat Kyrgyzstan by two or more goals in the other Group D match. Malaysia high pressure tactics to break stubborn Taiwanese defense turned Ori when Yu Yao Xing broke the host's defense line in the 20th minute to draw the first blood. Harima Malaya, however, continued its hunt for a goal, but nothing panned out until the first half whistle. Into the second half, Malaysia launched barrages of attacks to exert pressure on Taiwan, and Safawi Rashid managed to level the scoreline in the 53rd minute. Paolo Jose then doubled the lead in the 69th before substitute Mohamed Adib Abdul Raop scored the third goal late into the game. Despite ending their final group match as winners, Malaysia were eliminated from the second round of World Cup qualifying after collecting only 10 points from six matches. While Oman led the group with 12 points and Kyrgyzstan 10 points from five matches with goal advantage over Harim Kim Pangun said the failure to win big in the match last night was due to several technical mistakes made in the first half. He, however, praised the mental strength showed by the national team as they staged a comeback against Taiwan. We are target to score, maximize you know, close to seven goals like that. We cannot achieve uh, this one. Uh, very painful. Uh, actually, uh, when we start game, we some take risk already. Uh, from the first minute, we I ask them to take a risk. But uh, yeah, it doesn't work very well. Some part, I think, technically, some some mistake. Uh, for Taiwan's coach Gary White, the defeat provided valuable lesson for his young players. And we gave a silly goal like we did at the end there, which was ridiculous. Um, and you can't do that at this level. And that was a good lesson for us. You know, it was a good lesson. They have to learn. Our players are in the changing room crying. You know, I've got 19 and 20 year old players in the changing room right now crying. And they need to cry. And they need to feel it. Because if they don't understand it, it's not going to be of any use to them. On another note, Pangun voiced his desire to continue guiding Malaysia, although the Harimau Malaya missed the chance to qualify for the third round of the 2026 World Cup qualifiers. The South Korean, whose contract ends early next year, said he wants to stay with the national team until the 2027 Asian Cup. In contract, I have to stay here. But... Not me, not I ask, I leave, eh? Yeah, force me to me force me to leave, I have to leave. This is what I'm saying. I always I put here, I put effort. But uh, time to time I am tired, eh? Very tired. Very tired, but uh, we still the end required and a fight. Not I ask to leave. I never ask to leave. I said, I want to stay here. I want to go to the next Asian Cup. However, the 55-year-old former Korean Football Association KFA team director would leave the decision on his fate to the FAM. Now that we're done with the local football scene, let's move on to English football, where Manchester United coach Eric Ten Hag will remain in the job for next season despite the team's lowest ever Premier League finish of eighth. According to British media report, the decision comes after an end-of-season review for the 2023-24 campaign, which finished on a high with a shock FA Cup final win over heavy favourites Manchester City. 
Sky Sports said Ten Hag is discussing a new deal with his contract entering its final season after two years in charge. Former Ajax Amsterdam coach Ten Hag had come under increasing pressure after 20 times English champions United suffered their worst start to a season since 1962-63 with eight defeats in their first 15 matches in all competitions. They ended up eighth after 14 defeats in their 38 league games and bowed out of the Champions League in the group phase. A poor second campaign for Ten Hag ended on a high note as he led United to a shock 2-1 victory in the FA Cup final against rivals Manchester City. But the build-up to the match at Wembley was dominated by talk over Ten Hag's future as a report said he would be sacked by United's new co-owner Jim Ratcliffe regardless of the result. Very unfortunate for Poland captain Robert Lewandowski will miss his country's Euro 2024 opener this weekend with a thigh injury. Lewandowski, 35, will be absent to face the Netherlands on 16th June after suffering the injury in Monday's 2-1 win in a friendly against Turkey. Barcelona forward Lewandowski was substituted after just 33 minutes on his 150th international appearance as Poland ended their Euro 2024 preparations with a victory. Following the game, Poland coach Mikhail Probierz had been upbeat about Lewandowski's injury, saying he was optimistic and there shouldn't be a problem. The absence of the prolific forward adds to the injury worries for Probierz. Hellas Verona attacked Carol Swiderski sustained an ankle injury while celebrating the opening goal against Turkey. Swiderski's club teammate, defender Power Dawid Dawic, strained his quadriceps during the game. Probiers will be without another striker for the tournament after Arkadius Milik suffered a knee injury in the warm up victory against Ukraine. Poland are unbeaten in eight games and have the reach to pass three European Championships finals, making it to the quarter finals in 2016. Done with football. Let's move on to tennis. Andy Murray said his grass game needs to improve if he is to make a decent Wimbledon showing after losing in the first round of the Stuttgart Open on Tuesday. A two-time champion at the All England Club, Murray lost 6-3 and 6-4 to star-struck American Marcus Giron, the number 54 who had not won a match in Stuttgart in two previous attempts. The 2013 and 2016 Wimbledon champion went down in 75 minutes. The Scot will drop out of the top 120 ranking as a result of his defeat. In the opening set, Murray volleyed into the net from close range to trail 4-2, with Giron closing out the set three games later. The 37-year-old won the first six points of the second set but was unable to keep up the momentum. Jack Draper will line up as your own second-round opponent. The Briton beat the 54th-ranked American in the Australian Open first round in January over five sets. And closing our bulletin this afternoon with a recap of our top story, UN voices alarm over Palestinians' death toll in Israeli rescue operation. Do join us again tonight at 8.30pm on TV1 in Saluran Brita RTM for more news. Or you can catch us online on RTM's Click website and mobile app. Till then, I'm Renee Fong. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Have a pleasant afternoon.